Well, I trust that that is your prayer. Lord, it's for your glory, not for us. It's for him that we live and move and have our being. I want to invite you to turn your Bibles this morning to James chapter number 2. And while you are turning there, I want to continue to encourage you as you work at memorizing the book of James um, and work through that. Uh, I've been really encouraged to hear many that have responded are telling me that they're working through it and um, piece by piece, and I realize that, uh, that that may be easier or more difficult for some. I want to encourage you to keep working at that. Um, it's been neat to hear from really all ages, uh, from teenagers on all the way up that are working through, and even some younger than that that are working through that. So that's exciting. Uh, Christianity is based on one solid principle. There is uh, one solid truth that is modeled for us and that makes Christianity so unique. It's really formulated by one single word, love. That is what makes Christianity different from really any other religion and what makes us different in our uh, service for the Lord. We, we often hear the, the popular verse, John 3.16, for God so loved the world, but I'd like to also draw your attention to 1 John 3.16, in which John then again writes, he said, Here, Hereby perceive we the love of God, uh, and because He laid down His life for us. For God so loved. How do we know what love is? Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He laid down His life for us. And he goes a little bit further into the, chapter, into the book of 1 John, in 1 John chapter 4, he talks even greater about love, one of the greatest love passages, I think, in uh, the New Testament. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us. That God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And that's the agape, sacrificial, selfless love that God demonstrates for us, that is demonstrated in the, 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 the epitome of that is in, in God Himself, who gave His only begotten Son to die on the cross for our sins. That is the model, that is the, the example of love for us. And not because He had a need, but because we did. Because we needed a Savior. We were dead in our sins, and so that we could live through Him. This is a love that's unique to Christianity. It's a love that's special, and it's the basis for it. In fact, this, this word love appears, this agape love appears 200 times, nearly 200 times in the New Testament. In fact, I like the way J.I. Packer, he, he drew this out a bit further, and, and he said in his book, Your Father Loves You, he says, and I quote, The Greek word agape, love, seems to have been virtually a Christian invention. Here's what he means by that. It is a new word for a new thing. Apart from about 20 occurrences in the Greek version of the Old Testament, it is almost non-existent before the New Testament. Agape draws its meaning directly from the revelation of, of God in Christ. And so, selfless, sacrificial love is really what Christianity is known by and demonstrated by. It is the solid principle and solid truth that sets it apart. And so therefore, if we're, if we're followers of God, then we are to be known by love as well. That ought to be our focus, our heartbeat. And James is actually going to draw us to this in James chapter number 2. In fact, in James chapter number 2 and verse 8, he calls this the royal law. That if you really fulfill the royal law, he says, according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And you do well. This is the law of God that Christians are to be known by. In fact, Jesus told His disciples in John 13 in the upper room before He was about to leave from them and be betrayed and then be hung on the cross. He said, a new commandment I give to you. And it's not new because this commandment had never been given before, because it was new in its modeling and its capability through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit in this new entity that was going to be created, which was the church. 
And he says, this new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another, one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That is the distinctive characteristic of the church, of believers, is love for each other. Now, the wonderful news for the church then is twofold. First of all, that we have received the greatest gift of love that can be known in anywhere in the world. We have received that gift through Jesus Christ and, and are partakers of a divine, perfect, selfless love through Jesus Christ. But then secondly, then, the wonderful news is that we have the greatest love to share with the world around us who needs love. We have the greatest love to share with one another who are in need of love. We have this gift that we can share with one another. And you see, what, was, what we lost in the garden of Eden when sin entered in the world was love. Selflessness or selfishness triumphed over God. It was, I want what I want. And I want for me and not about obeying God. It wasn't about what's best for others. It was about me. Love to God was gone. Love to man was lost. And of the first two children of Adam, one killed the other. Selfishness abounded when sin abounds, there is where selfishness abounds and love is lost. And so we see the reality of selfishness as a staple in our world. We've been robbed of love and there is selfishness is everywhere. Man needs and craves for genuine love. And as the old song says, there, many are looking for love in all the wrong places. People are seeking for love through through sexual relationships or uncommitted relationships, through material possessions, through all different forms and fashions, looking for love. Looking for where is the, the model for this? Where can I go to find the answer? And the answer is through Jesus Christ and is modeled to us and preached to us and held to us through the church of Jesus Christ. It is be known by love. So the church has the answer. Christians have love and inside, have love inside and, and love to share that. And that's why John said in 1 John 4:11, the very next ones after I read earlier, "Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another." But we, we mentioned already the greatest hindrance: selfishness. And selfishness is, was rearing its ugly head in the time of James. It's really been rearing its ugly head all the way since the Garden of Eden, as we mentioned, but here it was, it was struggling within the body of Christ there uh, in the book of James that he was writing to the, the Jewish believers that he was writing to. And he writes this letter to believers as he presents the threat of partiality or prejudice in which they weren't giving unconditional, selfless love. They were being partial and prejudiced. And the honest truth is this, that Prejudice, although very real and just as ugly when it comes to skin color or ethnicity, is manifested in very many different ways. It is not just limited to these two issues. It can manifest itself regarding issues of economic status, educational status, popularity status, health and fitness status, and we could go on and on. Prejudice really abounds in many ways. So if we were to define it, prejudice is treating two people differently based on external circumstances, conditions, or differences. And so we must strive to eliminate that from our lives. We must strive to not hold up external differences, external circumstances, by which to judge people and by which that we can determine if they're worthy of our love, worthy of us giving out the, the, the great love of Jesus Christ to them. The church ought to be a place that, that is colorblind. Uh, the church ought to be a place that, that, that sees past uh, whether someone has degrees behind their name, that sees past someone's bank account, that sees past all those things to determine that they are worthy of love. That's what the church ought to be known by. In his autobiography, Mahatma Gandhi tells about uh, that during his student days, he read the Gospels. He began to study through what Christianity was all about and seriously and considered converting to Christianity. He believed that in the teachings of Jesus he could find the solution to the caste system that was dividing the people in India. 
So one Sunday, he determined he was going to go to a church. And he was going to determine if this was real and if he could find out more about it. So he went to a nearby church to talk to the minister about becoming a Christian. But when he came in the church, the usher that was there refused to give him a seat and suggested that he go worship with his own people. To which Mahatma Gandhi walked out, left the church and never returned. He said this, if Christians have caste differences also, I might as well remain a Hindu. That usher's prejudice not only betrayed Jesus, but also turned a person away from trusting him as his Savior. We don't recognize how important it is that we demonstrate love. We don't recognize how detrimental and dangerous prejudice or partiality is to the church of Jesus Christ. And so James, with a concerned and passionate, a compassionate pastor's heart, is going to lay out in verses 1 through 13 five different points as he's driving the point that we are to love and not have prejudice. And we're going to look at a couple of those this morning. We're not going to get through all this this, this morning. We'll look at uh, this over the, this week and next, if the Lord allows, and so we can see the importance of love and not prejudice. But let's have a word of a prayer together, and then we'll look at the Word of God. Uh, and see James' points here. Father, we do pray, as we come to Your Word, and we can certainly see the relevance of the need for love and not prejudice, the, the need to, to care for people unconditionally as You cared for us and loved us so much that You gave Your only begotten Son for us. Lord, to help that we might internally look at our own lives to see is there partiality that we show, is there selfishness manifesting itself in any places. And so, God, I pray that Your truth would come forth this morning and Your Spirit have the uh, ability and the freedom to work in this place to speak to hearts. Lord, that we might be a place of love, that we might be a people of love. Lord, that we would model You in this. God, thank You so much for the free gift of love that You gave us through Jesus Christ that we aren't worthy of, we didn't deserve but yet for our sakes, you sent your Son to be the propitiation, the payment for our sins. Lord, we want to thank you for that. So Father, I ask this morning as, as I preach, I pray that you would fill me with your Spirit, empty me of myself, and allow me to speak the words that you'd have me to say, that I might encourage and challenge and exhort this, your people, for your glory's sake. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, let's look at this together. And the first point I want you to notice that James points to is the, the foundation of love versus prejudice. And he really makes this, the, this initial statement in verse 1 that he's going to then support throughout verses 2 through 13. And I realize that your notes say chapter 1. We are in chapter 2. Uh, that is my mistake as we printed that wrong. Um, but he begins here in verse 1 making his clear statement where he says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Now when he says do not, the Greek construction actually has the idea of stop doing this. As if it was already taking place. There was already partiality that was manifesting itself within the body. And, uh, and he says to them, basically, stop it. Stop doing this. Stop showing partiality. You're, you're taking the, the glorious gospel, the love of Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, and you're holding it back. Stop doing that. Because notice that there's what we possess. We possess the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ that saves us from the punishment of our sins and destruction of our sin and reconciles us back to God. We possess the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. And He is the Lord of glory. So the point is, don't hold that truth. Don't hold that love with partiality. Now we hear that word partiality and sometimes we don't recognize the, the significance or the punch that that word has. Uh, when I grew up, maybe because I was a country boy growing up and did those things, we would say, I'm partial to certain things. I'm partial to Coke over Pepsi or I'm partial to Chevys over Fords, or, and I'm partial to the different things. And what we meant when we said that, and maybe you say that type of thing as well, is that I prefer this over that. Well, that is the idea, but it's much stronger in the Greek here as he uses this term. 
as this term uh, carries a stronger prejudice and, uh, and simply a preference and implies it than, than simply a preference and it implies rather making a judgment on the true worth of an individual. Is this person worthy? It's making a judgment on that person's worth. In fact, the King James uses the translated respecter of persons. Don't hold this with respecter of persons. It literally means a lifting up of someone's face. And by that it means it's a way to judge someone in a superficial manner as you look at them from the outside, look at their face, and you determine, are they worthy of my love? Are they worthy of me being uh, beneficial to them and extending out kindness to them or not? Judged by superficial external measures. And aren't you glad that God, isn't impar- or that God isn't partial that way? Aren't you glad that He is impartial? That He loves us in- unconditionally? It doesn't say, for God so loved the rich that He gave His only begotten Son. It doesn't say that, that God so loved only a certain su- sect of society. Or that God so loved only, only those in the United States. No, it says, so God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. In fact, Deuteronomy 10, 17 states that for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. He he is even towards every person and He demonstrates His love towards every person, towards me and towards you. The point there being that He isn't going to judge and occur for anyone. In fact, that's what it Paul speaks the same sentiment in, in Romans 2 in verse 11 where he, he states that for there is no partiality with God. God is going to be consistent and even. He's going to judge evenly and He offers love and grace evenly because there's no partiality with God. And so He's our perfect example of this. And so here's the thing. God doesn't see you based on superficial means. He looks and knows who you are. He looks at your heart. He cares about your heart more than anything else. In fact, if you remember back when uh, Samuel was sent to anoint the next king after Saul. And and, and so he he comes um, to to look at the family of of Jesse and first son he sees is Eliab. He sees Eliab and Eliab is the oldest. He's, He's... Uh, a a well-built man, and Samuel says to himself, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. God says, no, no, no. He's not the one. I've rejected him. And then he tells Samuel something very important. He says, do not look at his appearance or his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. God cares about who you genuinely are. He doesn't judge based upon superficial, external circumstances or those things. And he modeled, Jesus modeled that all throughout his ministry as well. It didn't matter to Jesus if he was talking to some wealthy religious leader or a common beggar. If he's talking to a virtuous woman or a, a prostitute, a high priest, or a, a common worshiper. It didn't matter to Jesus if they were handsome or ugly, athletic or crippled, educated or non-educated. His concern was always the condition of the soul. Where are they in their soul, in their heart? And He went to them. That is the love-filled, Christ-like perspective that we have as a church. That we have as Christians that we look beyond the superficial, we look beyond the status situations, we look beyond who can offer me the most things. And we look to the heart. And we get a burden for souls. If we could see beyond outward things and see like Christ, that has been my prayer many, many times in my life. God, help me to see souls and not people that way not see people on the externals. That ought to, be, ought to be our prayer regularly. God, help me to see the people around me in my workplace that they're, just, that they're going through and they're, they're reacting to different circumstances in their life, but let me see them as souls in need of love, someone who's looking for the truth, someone who needs uh, the love of Jesus Christ. Help me to see souls above everything else. 
So it doesn't matter whether they're a beggar or if they're rich. It doesn't matter any of those outward things. So we see the foundation of love versus prejudice in that first statement there in verse 1. Then he goes a little bit further and he's going to give us the function of prejudice versus love. He's going to give now an example or a a situation there um, of what this prejudice looks like. And he uses language that scholars tell us indicates that this type of thing was again was actually happening. Uh, So this is is something that's happening in a church there. Scenario plays out like this. He says, and I'll, let me read it, for there, if there should come into your assembly, and the word assembly there is the word synagogue, uh, which is the word for synagogue, an assembly of people. He's, he's speaking to Jewish readership and they would understand the gathering of people together. And so he says, if there comes someone into your public gathering for worship, is the idea there, and uh, there comes in a man with gold rings and fine apparel, there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, And you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place and say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? And so basically in comes this one guy. He's got gold rings over all his fingers. That was kind of the status symbol of the day. In fact, they tell us, historians tell us that there were actually shops in Rome where you could rent rings. So you could have the status. If you're going to a big public social gathering, you could rent gold rings so you could look like you were, you know, the man uh, or the woman, I guess, as it would be. And so this was a big social status. And this guy has got it together. And it says he has fine clothing, fine raiment. In fact, the word there, fine, means bright, radiant. This guy, when he walks through the doors, he catches your attention. This guy has got it together. He looks sharp. He is wearing the Armani suit. He's got on the, uh, you know, the Rolex watch. He's got the rings. He's got the jewelry. This guy looks like a million bucks. And, and that's the idea. And, and that would be the same thing today as it would be back then. And, uh, and, and so then he, makes a, uh, another, he presents another guy. The second guy comes in about the same time and he's poor. He has tattered clothes that are, that are dirty. Uh, as it, it doesn't have all the necessarily maybe all the means to, to buy the Armani suit and all that kind of stuff and, and those things, but he comes in just the same, wanting to worship God, wants to come into the gathering. And what happens is both are sized up. Somebody's there and checks them out and says, yeah, yeah, I'm going to grab this guy that looks really sharp, that's got a lot of means and looks like he could be influential and I want him to come and have a great seat. You see, in the synagogues, they would normally have some upfront regular seats. There wasn't a whole lot of benches oftentimes in the synagogues. And so they'd have their benches up front. Those were called the cheap seats. You remember, in fact, the, Jesus even called out the Pharisees for you long to have the cheap seats. And there would sometimes be some benches around the sides, but many times people would stand or they'd bring their own little footstool or things like that to sit at. He says, so this guy comes in, he looks sharp, looks like he could be very influential. And, uh, and so we say, this guy comes in and says, hey, come on over here, I want to give you a great seat right up here. You are worthy of this, you are worthy of a good spot, and we're going to give you honor through this. But he looks at the other guy who's in older, dirty clothes, probably doesn't smell the best, and he says, but you, you need to stand off to the side. You stand over here, or if you want, you can sit on the floor next to my footstool. You can sit next to me. I'm not giving up my seat for you. You can sit over here. Now, we we hear that and we think, what a a crazy scenario. Does that actually happen? And the reality is, yes. Uh, and, And I thought about this analogy and I asked myself, why? Why would someone be willing to show such honor and and give up these things for someone that they deemed as worthy of their respect? And the answer is simply selfishness. What can I get out of showing respect and honor this person? What can they offer me? If I'm good to them, if I honor them, maybe they will help our church. Maybe they will help me as I deal with the situation. And it will be good for me to rub shoulders and be on the right side of this guy. But this poor man over here, I mean, what can he really offer me? Yeah, he can't help me in any way. And so behind truly prejudice is selfishness. And and so we see that here taking place. And uh, 
you know, there was a selfishness and this mentality of looking down on people was kind of the mentality of the day. Um, this idea of social differences that are still very real in many different societies yet today. And it's helpful that we understand that the early converts of Christianity were poor for the most part. Uh, many of them did not have much means or if they came to Christ, they often lost much of their means because it meant that they were taking their cross to follow Christ and they were often rejected by family, rejected by the, the, the Jewish establishment of, of, of uh, maybe bosses or employers who would lay them off if they claimed the name of Christ. And so oftentimes, the early church were poor individuals. And, and so this is what the kind of reality was. In fact, in AD 178, a Roman philosopher, uh, Celsus, even wrote a, a malicious letter trying to degrade the, uh, the, the Christians of the day because of their, uh, their status and their poorness. And, and he, he likened them to frogs holding a symposium amid a swamp or worms in a convention in a corner of mud, end quote. So that was the common thing of the, of the day. If you didn't have status if you didn't have wealth, if you didn't have means, then you weren't worth near as much. And so James is writing this and saying, this ought not ever to be amongst believers. Ought not ever be in the church. Because Christianity, the love of Christ, changes everything. It changed that thinking. In fact, if you remember, when the church began the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter number 2, by the end it says that they were all giving and saying, here we want to give to meet needs. And they had all things in common. There was a genuine love for one another. The result of receiving Jesus Christ, the result of a, of a church who is manifesting Jesus Christ is love and care for one another that doesn't care for themselves or doesn't care for statuses, but cares for one another in, uh, with, with great compassion. Mark Devon in his book, in a book, Deliberate Church wrote, when the gospel enables us to live in love, even though we may have nothing else in common save Christ, it is a testimony to its power to transform a group of sinful, self-centered people into a loving community united by a common relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what the gospel does. It transforms and James says that if we are partial and we, we do this scenario as he just lays out, instead of loving, he says, we have evil thoughts. You're displeasing God. You see, it's not, when we have prejudice towards people, it's not merely sociological, it's theological. We have turned against God's plan and we have said, God, I realize that, that you love mankind, but I'm choosing not to. It is sin when we have prejudice towards individuals based upon different superficial statuses. It's not merely sociological. You see, the prejudice and the problems that we have going through our society today is there is different, uh, different lives matter and all this different stuff that's going on. It's not merely a sociological thing. It starts with reform here in the church house. It starts amongst the people of God who say, you know what, God loved me not because I was a Jew. God loved me not because of my economic status. God loved me simply because I'm a soul that He created and He, he, he deemed me worthy of His Son, Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter if someone around me is black, yellow, white, or it doesn't matter what their status is. We have to love one another unconditionally if we are truly the body of Christ. There's where it starts. It's a theological issue, not a sociological issue. And he says, if you don't do that, it's sin. You are deeming or you are carrying evil thoughts. And by the way, let me just, let me just say as a side point, he's not saying that having wealth was a sin. He's not saying that this man who comes in with the gold rings, he's not actually condemning the man who has wealth. The church did have some who were in the New Testament era who were wealthy, and there's nothing wrong with that. They used their wealth for the glory of God. Joseph of Arimathea used his status and his wealth to say, let me get the body of Christ and let me anoint him, let me put him in my tomb, which I've had hewn out at great expense. And I'm going to put Jesus Christ in there. We're going to anoint his body with great, great expense. We have Barnabas a very wealthy man who's selling off lands, a son of encouragement, and saying, here, let me give the church. 
so that it can be dispersed amongst. So there was many people. We have Cornelius, the, the, the Gentile man, or the first of the, the Gentiles who the, the, the gospel comes to. He's a man of great wealth and, and, and prestige. He says, I want you to come and preach not only to me, but preach also to my, to my servants and those around me. He cared for others. And so there are those in the church that he's saying, it's not about whether you have money or not. The condemnation of evil thoughts is those who we, we are prejudiced towards. It's us, whether, how we look at people. And so, um, we need to have a Christ-like love. And again, Jesus Christ is the greatest example of impartiality. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that you through His poverty might become rich. Jesus Christ was completely impartial. Completely selfish. He didn't say, well, or selfless. He didn't say, well, what can I get out of this if I go down there, God, and, and give my life for them? He said, I'm going to give it all. I was completely rich. I was full of glory. Yet, the Bible says in Philippians 2, he willingly laid that aside. They might be born in humility for us. So, there we have not only the foundation of love versus prejudice, then he gives us this illustration, this uh, this function of prejudice versus love, and he condemns us and says, you are being judges of evil thoughts. But let's go to a third point this morning, and that is this, the foolishness then of prejudice versus love. He kind of lays out how uh, this is not only wrong, but it's foolish. It doesn't even make sense is his idea here. Let's notice verses 5 through 7. He, he gives out a couple of different reasons. He says, Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which He promised to those who love Him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do not they blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? He lays it out and says, this doesn't even make sense. Think about this, why this is foolishness to be prejudiced towards the poor. And he's going to specifically, as he's drawing this analogy of the poor individuals and prejudice towards the poor, he's going to use that, he's going to drive that. But notice he's, first of all, gives us the foolishness of rejecting God's plan. Listen, my beloved brethren. He kind of stops and says, listen up. My beloved brethren. This is the, the, the fifth time he has used that term, brethren. My beloved brethren. Listen, this is important. Think about this. Has God not chosen the poor of this world? to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which He has promised to those who love Him. And so he asks this rhetorical question. Now, he isn't insinuating that the kingdom of God is only for the poor in this world. That's not what he's insinuating here. Because, because being poor has no merit. There is no merit in poverty. But the reality is, and I have seen this in many cultures, that, many, or that poor people often realize how short life is and thus they see their need for eternal uh, salvation, their need for eternal life more readily than the rich do. It is more difficult for the rich to trust in their riches and what they have as their means to feeling secure and feeling okay. And God says, I, I have opened the door to the poor and many that are going to be in eternal life, many that are going to be in the kingdom come from poor situations. So he's, he's kind of saying, isn't that ridiculous then to turn from that. Jesus even, even taught this. In Mark 10, when the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, what, what do I need to do to eternal, inherit eternal life? And he talks him through some of the commandments and those things for a little while. And he says, I've done all these things. He said, well, then go sell all that you have and give to the poor. At that point, the man was not really willing to yield and follow Christ. And he turns away sorrowful, for he had much possessions and Jesus turns to his disciples after that and he says, he says, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter into the kingdom of God. Not impossible, but hard. It is hard to put away what we see temporally right in front of our faces and to become poor in spirit, uh, as we saw in Matthew 5, verse 3, recognizing that I really don't have anything of my own merit that I can prop up to trust in. I need Jesus Christ. I need a Savior and, and that's what he's saying there. Is, and so the reality is, is God has, 
not limit the kingdom to merely the rich, but many of the poor will be there also. There will be many poor there also. I'm thankful for that. When I was uh, privileged to go over and visit our missionaries to encourage them, and I was down in South Africa with Jim and Terry Miller, uh, there was a young man that they'd been witnessing to and uh, they had been working with. They had, he had come to Christ and they actually helped through Christ then. It, it reconciled their marriage and things got better and they were training him and preparing him to help take over uh, a church plant they wanted to do in a little township called Fasantacraw. Now when we think of townships, we think of a, a town like this. That's not what townships are. The townships are basically like squatter camps. Uh, it is the lowest of the low in South Africa. Um, and it was so encouraging to develop a relationship with this guy, Alec, and his family. We'd go pick him up and, and basically live in a little, a little uh, shack uh, in this township with no running water in there. Uh, they actually have um, public, uh, basically public porta johns that uh, several families will go together and, and will get a key for. And so there'll be several families who share a public port john and that's how it works. There'll be all these lined up. This guy has nothing. But I can tell you what a joy it was to fellowship with him. He'd come out of that house with his family and to spend time with him and to talk with him and his family and realize that someday we're going to stand side by side before the throne of God, worshiping, him and he- worshiping our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for eternity. And, and who is to say that this, this poor individual, Alec, who has nothing really to his name on this side of heaven, isn't going to have some incredible status and position in heaven before the throne, who was faithful with little things and now God has made him ruler over many things. How ridiculous to see only from a short-sighted perspective and to not recognize God sees us much bigger. The person we might have had prejudice against that, that we thought, oh, they don't have much, they don't have much money, and so whatever, we don't need to really show respect to. How different it might be someday when we stand up in heaven and we realize, whoa, that person that I really didn't care for or show love to, they are now a ruler over many things. Has not God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which He has promised to those who love Him? They are rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom of God. How? By their faith and by their love. I find that interesting because these two go hand in hand. Did you notice the emphasis on loving Him? Uh, I, I think there is an indicator of what true saving faith will entail. It entails a love for Jesus Christ. In fact, even said over in chapter uh, 1 in verse 12, that uh, those who endure temptation will see the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love Him. There's an aspect of love will be evident in our serving Christ. Loving Christ is tied to following Christ. And so he's, he's saying that true saving faith has love for Christ in it. It's not simply and merely just uttering a prayer and going on living my life for me. It's, I want to live for Christ and I love Him. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. Repenting and following Christ. So the question is, can someone truly follow Christ as their Lord and, and seek after Him and follow Him, receiving from Him the great gift of forgiveness and, uh, and, and reconciliation back to the Father through Jesus Christ if they don't love Him? And I would say, no. That's not possible. It is necessary that, that we will love Him in response. Uh, he has given us so much, our response will be love. And so James here condemns them because they have dishonored the poor man. He says, this is one that is, loves God, is, trusts God, follows God, and just because he's poor, you have you've been partial. And he says, you have dishonored the poor man. You've been prejudiced. But then he goes on, and only mentions the rejection of God's plan, but it gives a second reason why this is foolish. It's foolishness, the foolishness of honoring God's enemies. And not only is it foolish to reject God's plan, but notice he asks now two more rhetorical questions. Uh, do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? He asks these two rhetorical questions here. You know, it's it amazing to me 
how we sometimes fawn over those who have status. Uh, we fawn over movie characters or, or those in Hollywood because they are beautiful in the outward appearance or because they make much money or they, they are good actors and we'll fawn over them. And, or, or those who are uh, athletes who can run down a field and catch a football and, and do their dance in the end zone. Uh, or we'll fawn over a, a music uh, person who's got great music ability. We get, we get so enamored by those outward things sometimes. I love the story that was read many years ago about a, a, a woman who entered into an ice cream store on the Kansas City Plaza. And after choosing her ice cream flavor and she received her cone, she looked up and found herself face to face with Paul Newman. Uh, now, some of you that are younger are saying, who's that? Um, I'll, it, was a, it was a person on television. I'll just leave it at that for those of you that are younger. Um, face to face with Paul Newman. And uh, she was so overwhelmed as he smiled and said hello. Her heart was pounding that she couldn't say anything. And she just kind of stuttered her way out and walked out of the, of the ice cream parlor. Well, then she's out in the out into the courtyard outside and she's looking around and after she kind of regained her bearings and she couldn't find what did she do with her ice cream cone. She's looking around and so she's walking back in and on the way back in she runs into Paul Newman again um, and he sees like this startled look on her face like she's looking for something and, and, and he asks her, uh, he said, are you looking for your ice cream cone? And she kind of nodded trying to get herself together and he said, uh, you put it in your purse with your change. <laughs> You know how we sometimes just fawn over those who have status? What, what difference does it make if someone is making millions of dollars and playing for the NFL or NBA or any of those things? Or if someone is your neighbor who has a hard time having a decent lawnmower to cut his grass? Or, or if they have a difficulty keeping their car running? Why should we show prejudice towards the one versus the other? Do not all the rich people that are there making money through uh, Hollywood and, and all those sports and athletes and all those things, aren't they making money truly at your expense? That's kind of the idea he's making here, the point here. Why are we going to give so much pleasure and, and honor to them in that situation? He, uses the, he asks the question, do not the rich oppress you? God's enemies use their strength to oppress the poor, whereas God is concerned with justice for the poor. All throughout Scripture, that is, is, is uh, completely uh, noted or, or uh, evident as he would give allotments for poor people regarding sacrifices. They could give different things. Or he'd give allotments so that their needs would be met and as crops were being uh, taken up in the year. He gave allotments for if someone is indebted that on the seventh year their debts would be erased. God continually cares for the poor. And yet he says, that, why, w why would you then show great honor to the rich who oppress you? The word oppress there means to exercise harsh control over, to use one's power against this word oppress is only found two times in the New Testament. The other time it's found in the book of Acts in chapter 10. And it speaks of Satan who oppresses people, using his abilities to try to come down and oppress people. And so he says then, and do they not drag you into the courts? William Barclay explained in his commentary that if a, a creditor met a debtor on the street, he could seize him by the neck of his robe, nearly throttling him and dr literally drag him into the law courts in that day. That's what James is describing here. There's not compassion or a model of godliness in that. They don't love mercy and love those whom God loves. So why do we fawn over and show partiality to people? And he adds another reasoning why this is foolish. Do not they blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? Uh, the word noble is the word kalas. It means beautiful, surpassing, admirable, praiseworthy, honorable. That honorable, praiseworthy name of Jesus Christ. That's what it's talking about. The King of kings. The Lord of lords. It has been given a name that the name of Jesus Christ every knee should bow and every tongue confess that He is Lord. The very name Christian means Christ's ones. 
We are called by His name. The word called has the idea of a bride taking the name of her groom. Taking the name of the one that she just married. We're the bride of Christ. We proudly carry the name of Christ. Everywhere we go, we are proud that we are given a new name. It's the name Christian. We are part of His kingdom. That's what we bear. But He says, many of the rich blaspheme or speak reproachfully at that name or disdainfully at that name. Why should we show favoritism to those who often don't really care about the name of Jesus Christ? What should be our focus? Now, I hesitated in, in sharing this, but I want to I take a little side rabbit trail for a second here, if you don't mind. Because we're talking about what really matters in a church. Love that is unconditional. There's a slogan that's being tossed around today in the political arena that is this, Make America Great Again. My question to you and, as, and to believers in the church is, what defines greatness? Is greatness determined by whether we have great economic status, a great military prowess, and our borders are secure? No. Make America Great Again starts here. Greatness is determined by moral goodness. And we need to then choose people who will pursue moral goodness in our country. But it begins with the people of God caring about moral goodness over anything else. Caring about moral goodness over who has so many billions of dollars to their name. I'm not telling you who to vote for. I'm not, I, I, that's between you and the Lord. I just want us to comp, contemplate what are we truly seeking for in a people, as a nation, are we truly seeking for moral goodness? What is the greatness that we are defining that by? And I realize there are some like Jerry Falwell Jr. and others who are saying that, that it, and in spite of social issues beyond the line like abortion or homosexuality or the definition of marriage and those things, that now is the time to shore up America's economy and military and later we will deal with those, those issues of social issues. And I say that is dead wrong. Now is the time to be concerned about morality. Now is the time to say, let, let's, let's as a people of God determine that we want to live as a people of God. We want to stand for the things of God. We want to stand for what is right. We want to love God first. And that's where James is going to go back to. He says, here's the royal law. Love your neighbor as yourself. Where's that, where's that start? Love the Lord your God. Here's the first commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind. And the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Listen, there's where it starts in the people of God to say, I want to love God first. I want Him to be primary in my life. That it doesn't matter to me about, uh, about uh, economic statuses. It doesn't matter to me who I think is going to give me the greatest security and those things. I want Him to be pleased. I want to line up with Him first and foremost in my life. And then because of that, I want to love my neighbor as myself. I don't want to have prejudice. I don't want to show partiality. Because I want God to be pleased with me. I want to serve Him. And I serve Him by serving others. On those hang all the law and the, ba all, all the, law and the prophets. We'll look at that further next week because we're going to be stopping here for sake of time with the last two points next week. But on those hang all the law and the prophets. Love God. And serve Him above everything else. Choose to follow Him. And secondly, love your neighbor as yourself. Love is critical. There is no place for partiality. There is no place for prejudice in the church of God if we truly want God to be honored. By this we know love because He laid down His life for us and we ought also to lay down our lives for the brethren. Let me wrap this up by giving one final biblical uh, demonstration to us, which is found in Matthew chapter number 25. In Matthew 25, Jesus Christ is speaking to us, speaking about when our Lord returns of His second uh, coming. He's going to gather up together all those on the earth, uh, judgment of the sheep and the goats, and he, he then 
uh, says to them on his right hand, the sheep on his right hand, it says, The king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him and saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or you thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and take you in, or, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you do it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. There it is. God says, don't show any prejudice. Go to show great love towards anyone who is in need, the least of these, my brethren. And when you do that, you're doing it unto the Lord. That is what the people of God ought to be known by. That is what First Baptist Church ought to be known by. A place where everyone is welcome. A place where everyone can come and, and receive the love of Jesus Christ. And they're not judged by different statuses. They're, they're, they're not welcomed on different levels, but everyone is welcome to come and hear and know and, and walk with Jesus Christ. In a place where we serve those who are the neediest and we love them like Christ loves us. That's what we ought to have. That ought to be our heartbeat. That's what we ought to know by. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this time together in your word. And Lord, what an important time in our society to consider whether we have genuine love selfless, agape, Christ-like, your love. Not only that we've received, but that we are giving. Lord, we are in need of love. And there is no greater love than Jesus Christ. And so thank you, Lord, that in spite of times that it's easy to think, am I loved? Thank you that you declare loudly to us that you love us. Lord, and I pray if there's anyone here maybe this morning who has never received that great gift of love, has never said, I repent of my sins and I want to receive the gift of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for my sins. I want that love that I can be reconciled to the Father. Lord, may today be the day that they turn from their sins acknowledge that great love and that grace that's offered through Jesus Christ and call on you to be their Savior. And God, for the church, for those of us who claim the name of Christ, Lord, help us to see past the outward facades. Help us to see past the, the sociological issues and see theologically. To see as you see to see as you determine worth and value and help us to love unconditionally. So Lord, I pray that you would help us that we would model that to this world. And God, I pray for revival to happen here in this place. But it's not going to happen in the courthouse. It's not going to happen in the, the government house. It's going to happen here in the church house amongst the people of God. May we be known by love for your glory's sake. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I want to give you just a, a moment right where you're at just to really take some time with the Lord to talk with Him. Maybe right where you're at to say, Lord, is there any prejudice in my life? Has there been maybe a neighbor, a co-worker, or a person who's come to church or someone that I've maybe looked at from a selfish, partial way. And I want you to cleanse me of that and help me to have genuine love for them. It's right where you're at, in the quietness of this room. I'd encourage you to talk with the Lord. And maybe you come here today and you say, 
well, I, I need the love of Jesus Christ personally. And I've, I've never accepted that. I, I want to receive that great love of God through Jesus Christ and make Him my Lord and my Savior. I want to take the name of Jesus Christ. Listen, you could do that. You could talk with the Lord today. Simply acknowledge your sins and acknowledge your need for Him and what Christ in the cross, dying on the cross, taking and bearing the punishment for your sins so that you could be freed and ask Him to forgive you. Just right here in the quietness of this room, we're just going to have a time to evaluate and talk with the Lord. Father, you're so good and gracious. We want to thank you for your goodness to us. We want that goodness and love to be manifest not only in us, but through us and coming out of us to one another. Help us to see needs with compassion. Help us to see people as souls. Lord, help us to be the body of Christ going out and sharing the light of Jesus Christ to the dark world. And help us to be the body of Christ within, ministering to each other, meeting needs with one another, giving freely to one another, that we might be pleasing to you as a people of God. It's in your name we pray. Amen.